Praise God. It's interesting this morning, I was in there just spending time with the Lord and, and having an amazing time. And he's given me the next, I think, four messages. And the next three, four messages for Wednesday night. Because, see, God is wanting us to be prepared for his dwelling place. <clears throat> and where the glory of God can dwell, it spills over into the community. Amen. Because each one of us are changed in his presence so strongly that, I mean, you will just, you will you'll, we'll be witnesses to our neighbors, we'll be witnesses to wherever we're at. But the atmosphere of the city begins to change and become God conscious. Because when, you know, if God's presence dwells in some place where his glory can dwell, it just springs out to the whole community. And I shared this a few weeks ago. There's a difference between the anointing and the glory. Huge difference. All, all of us are anointed. We will continue to be anointed. We, the gifts of the Spirit have been given to us. But the glory realm is different. Because in the glory realm, no flesh can boast. You can be carnal. And I, and I, I don't mean that in such a bad sense other than, you know, we can, we can kind of be a, a carnal type Christian or whatever and, and the, the gifts will flow. Are we... Walk in such purity and character, the gifts will flow. But when the glory of God begins to settle over his people, flesh is so dealt with that only the new man lives. And it's a whole new realm. Then the gifts will be maximized. Then the gifts will flow powerfully. And not just within these four walls, but out there. Out there in the community, the gift of healing, miracles will can flow to people. Where signs and wonders can begin to be done among people. Where Jesus said, whatever city you enter, heal the sick in it. That's why in the book of Acts you see that any time they entered into a city, there was revival and usually revival and riot at the same time because the kingdom of God through the church invades the darkness that's in a community. And that's what happens when we as the body of Christ get glorified. And that means God's glory presence is with us. And um, so we're heading into that dimension of glory that we've never, we haven't been in yet. We've received the presence, the weight of glory. That's when he comes in here and we just all just kind of like, just, man, we're just soaked in his presence. But that's not the Shekinah. The Shekinah is when God tabernacles himself, literally. And the kingdom of God is in a sanctuary. Uh, we become the sanctuary of that kingdom on earth. Totally different place. And that's where we're headed into this wonderful dimension of glory. I want to talk to us this morning about delighting in his glory and grace. Delighting in it. You know, when we're, everything about the Lord is delightful. There's nothing hard about God. I used to hear old timers talk about, oh, the burden of the Lord. Well, you ought to read, I think it's Jeremiah, says, Woe to those who say the burden of the Lord. And he rebukes Israel, for, the priests especially, for saying, You're calling what I've called you to a burden. And he rebuked them. Jesus said his burden is what? Life. It's easy. Why? Because of his anointed presence with us. By taking his yoke upon us. By learning of him. For I'm meek and lowly, says God. The Lord Jesus said that. Come and learn of me. Come on. Take my yoke upon you. It's easy. It's light. It, it won't weigh you down. It'll bring life to you. See, everything God touches turns into life. 
So we as a body should never be burdened down. The only reason I get burdened down or any of us because we've yoked ourselves with the things of the world or with our own self. And, and, and it's not letting the, Lord, the yoke of Jesus come upon us. Where we're yoked together with him, then he does all the pulling, we just go along with him. That's a good deal. Because when we do our own thing, we are pulling against him. So God sets us free from ourself so that he can yoke us with himself. And then we become full of light, life and love. We become full of the goodness of God. I want to read in the, uh, this is so powerful in the uh, Passion Translation. It was so powerful I wrote it in my Bible so I can have it with me all the time. If you want to know why David was a man after own God's own heart, well, first of all, it says in Acts 13, it's because he did all of God's will. And this gives us an example of David's heart towards God so that he did do all of God's will. And so this, I don't know, do we have the Passion Translation? Anyway, I'm going to start reading it. It's in uh, Psalms 27.4. Here's the one thing I crave from God. The one thing I seek above all else. I want the privilege of living with Him every moment in His house. Think about that. Living in His house. That means living in His presence. Living with Him. In fact, He said that He and the Father would come and make their home in us. And that he would come and break bread with us. And David said, this is the one thing I crave from God. The one thing I seek above all else. Now I want to tell you something. That might be your desire. But if you don't follow it with obedience, it'll never come to pass. You say, what do you mean obedience? Obedience to what you find in his presence. I'll talk about Kenneth Copeland because this is old 20 years ago stuff, 30 years ago maybe. Brother Hagen used to have experiences with Jesus all the time. And Jesus would come and sit and talk to him and peer to him. So Kenneth Copeland went to the Lord and said, Lord, why don't you come to me like that, like you do with Brother Hagen? And, and uh, the Lord spoke to him and says, God, I don't like you. This is right out of Kenneth Copeland's testimony, so I'm not talking. And the Lord said, I don't like you. You're mean. You're mean-spirited. You don't love my people. I don't like hanging out with you. He said, I love you. I don't like you. And Kenneth Copeland repented. Because if any of you followed him 30, 40 years ago, he was mean. I mean, he was mean. Mean-spirited. And God told him, he said, and as you start walking in love, I won't hang out with you. And that's the year that Kenneth went in, took the whole month of the first year of that off the whole. He, he shut down all of his meetings for that next year. And he sought the, and that's when he come out and started teaching on the royal law of love. Because God changed his character. And I'm saying that to say this. Your desire for the Lord has to turn into such a testimony that you're like him, that you won't be mean spirited in any way. You won't be judgmental. You won't be critical. You, none of those things can be in you if you're going to spend time with the Lord. I've known uh, pastors that they talked about, oh, just living in the presence of God. And they were mean. They, they were, they, they, their character didn't go along with what they said they were doing. I know ministers that, oh, they love, oh, I just love to be with the Lord. And their, and, and their family didn't like them because they were mean-spirited to their family. What I'm saying to us, church, is the evidence and fruit of you living in the presence of God is that you become more like Jesus. And you quit trying to tell other people how to be like Jesus. Just be like Him. Let the Holy Spirit work through your life to tell others their need of what they have of God. He doesn't need our help. 
He needs our obedience. And I can tell you this, to live in the presence of the Lord is to live in obedience because obedience is better than sacrifice. And a lot of times we say, well, I, I just love worshiping God. And I just, you know what? That's sacrifice. It's not obedience. But out of worship comes obedience. Out of love comes obedience. So you can't fool anybody. You can say this all you want. This is my number one desire. But the proof of it is your lifestyle, who you are, how you love the body of Christ, how you treat others. That tells me you're living in the same house Jesus lives in. <laughs> Don't get so quiet on me. Come on, this is good news. Because you can't, if you're going to hang out with Jesus, you're going to be like him. You're going to be just like him. You're going to love him more. That's what David did. He says, Lord, this is the one thing above everything else I seek is the privilege. Oh, that is so powerful. Of living with you every moment in your house, finding the sweet loveliness of his face. And you know, we as, new, as Christians... We can have a face-to-face -face relationship with Jesus. In fact, he said, seek my face. We'll look at that in a minute. He wouldn't tell us to do something if he wasn't going to show us his face. And his face is full of love and full of life and full of zeal and full of, of, of his eyes are just... Uh, people ask me, what does his eyes look like? Because I've seen him and he, all I can say is they're, they're liquid love. Just flowing out of his eyes. It's not about the color. It's about what's coming out of the eye. Man, this, this, this lights me up. And then, when we see His face, when we do really live in His presence, then we are filled with awe. Awe is the fear of the Lord because we're in His presence. We, we, we're in awe of him. I talked about John a few weeks ago about when, when John saw him as the Lord of glory, he fell on his face because of awe. When the cloud overshadowed them, they fell on their face because of awe. God is here. And that's what happens in the dimension of glory. Every revival that I've ever studied, when the, the presence and power of God, the people would fall on their face before him. Just because of his presence is so powerful. No flesh can, bless, bless, can boast in it. That is awesome. But the thing I'm trying to say is, this is why David did the will of God. And this is why you and I can do the will of God. It's because of his passionate love for God. His passionate love for God and his word. You know, Christians can love God and not love His Word. Not obey the Word. Andrew, gives the, Andrew Womack gives the example, and I can say this because it's a testimony that he gives, but there was a, 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 CB, a Karis Bible College student that came, very, very liberal. Loved the Lord, baptized in the Holy Spirit, but just, I mean, her views were just way out there. And after a year, her whole belief system changed in relationship to, to, to uh, what, what is consistent with the Word of God. And Andrew asked her, said, how could you, a quote, spirit-filled Christian, be so left-minded and liberal-minded and now you've changed. He said, because I love the Lord, but I didn't love his word. There's a difference. You can't fully love the Lord unless you love his word. And the more time you spend in the presence of God, the more this word becomes precious. It's not just law-based. I have to read the word. Oh, I've got to get in the word today. No, we want the word to get in us. And that's what happens when we stand in awe of him. And then it says, delighting in his glory and grace. 
delighting in it. When His glory and grace comes in your life, and in the life of this church as a congregation, we will delight in it. We will live delighting in His glory and grace. It's a lifestyle. Why? Because we are seeking Him above everything or anybody else. Our desire is to live in His house with Him. Our desire is all about Him so that His awe can inspire us to delight in His glory and grace. See, it's a delightful thing. Christians, we shouldn't go around with a sad face. I'll read that in the next scripture. It's powerful. You can't spend time with Jesus and not be filled with, with, with this love and joy and glory and grace. Our delight is in the glory and grace of God. Our delight is in the fear of the Lord. It says Jesus was anointed, and the last one was he was anointed with the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord was his delight. What does that mean? That means Jesus dwelt in the presence of his Father, and that was his delight. You can't live in his presence and not have a great reverence for him. <laughs> I mean, awesome thing. Because God wants us. Here's the thing I really hear the Spirit of grace telling us. God wants us to, to delight in His glory and grace. It's an awesome thing that's been given to us, the church. We've received grace upon grace. We're changed from glory to glory. So that why? So that we can delight in the Lord. That our delight is in the presence of the Lord. Literally, His presence is with us. And I desire His presence more than anything or anybody else on this whole earth. I, this, this is so powerful. I want to live my life so close to Him that He takes pleasure in my every prayer. We can be praying wrong things. We can be praying judgment over people. We can be praying witchcraft prayer over people by trying to conform them to what we think they ought to be through our prayers. And that's not right. That's not God. But if I'm living a life so close to the Lord, then our prayers are pleasant to Him. And He can answer those prayers. When you don't know how to pray, keep your mouth shut and pray in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Who knows how to pray when we don't know how to pray as we ought? Right. We have to so separate ourselves from our emotions or our feelings towards another brother or sister in the Lord or a family member or somebody that we separate that in the presence of God so that we're not praying our desire over somebody. And guess what? God won't answer that prayer and he won't listen to it. But someone else will. The prince of power of the air. So if we're living close to him, this is what thrills me. That he takes pleasure in my prayers. Why? Because they're in line with him. Is that awesome? Yes. He's not going to listen to me. He's not going to listen to our old man carnal prayers. He's not listening. He has a deaf ear to our carnality. But he hears the prayer of our spirit and a pure heart. And that are in accordance with his word. And his being of who he is. The sons of thunder. The cities that rejected the Lord. Oh, let's call fire down on them and Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. <laughs> he says, we're not going to do that. And the son of thunder, John, became the apostle of love because of his time and the presence. He, wanted, he loved the presence of God more than anything. This is awesome. We, so, so that we can delight in his glory and grace. If, we can, if you have heaviness or doubt or anything, it's because you're not dwelling in his, in his dwelling place. And then verse 8 says, Lord, when you said to me, seek my face, 
my inner being responded, I'm seeking your face with all my heart. There was a response. There was a response to God. David said, God said, seek my face. David said, I'm seeking your face with all my heart. And what does that mean with all my heart? It means no part of your heart is seeking anything else other than his face. It says, the scripture says, seek his presence, his face continually. And sometimes we're all guilty. I've been guilty of this. We all can be guilty. We, sometimes we seek his face uh, spasmodically. I'm seeking his face and then we get off of seeking his face. Then we come back to seeking his face. At least he's happy that you're seeking his face once in a while. But he would prefer that you seek it continually. And the downside that I've seen in Christians' lives is that they want to seek the face of God when they're in trouble. To get them delivered from the trouble. Once they get set free, then they quit seeking his face. Because they gravitate towards... I've known people personally who financially didn't have much money. And they were, they were in church every Sunday. They were seeking the Lord. They were full of... I mean, really, literally, I'm telling the truth. And then they hit the jackpot, so to speak. Their company opened up. And all of a sudden, they had a lot of money. Slowly, they quit coming to church. Slowly, they just... And the next thing you know, they're in trouble. I had one friend of mine, they ended up in a divorce. Why? Because they moved away from the one who got them there. God has no problem blessing you. But if the blessing overtakes your seeking the Lord, then it becomes a curse, not a blessing. But I've learned if I continually love Jesus and, and seek his face, he'll bless me and bless me and bless me. Sometimes I've said, Lord, I, I, you're blessing me so much, I don't, I'm in, I don't know what to do with all this. I'm serious. I am so blessed. I am blessed. I'm blessed. I'm telling you, I just say, Lord, I, I don't deserve any of this, and I don't, but through him, I do. He loves to bless his children. He loves to. But don't move away to the left or the right of the blessings. Stay focused on Him. Don't move to the things of life. Don't move to the things of the world. Stay focused on Him. Solomon, the wealthiest man that ever lived in the world. Got his eyes off of the Lord. And finally he wrote in Ecclesiastes, Vanity, vanity, all things are vanity. Why? Because he got his eyes off the Lord. But he finally come to a conclusion. It's all about God. It's all about God. So listen, church. God has already told us, once you were born again, his, his, the cry of the Spirit to you is, seek the face of Jesus. Seek his face. And the Holy Spirit's encouraging us because we're moving into a glory revival. And, and He wants your heart being prepared to move into that. And what that means is He can dwell with you. It starts with you. And it hits all of us. This is beautiful. You know, as Christians, man, if we don't want to seek the face of God, we're, we, there's a problem. Because if I seek his face, other faces won't pull me away to do, won't, won't, I, won't, I won't have the fear of man. The faces of finances, I won't have, I don't have to be concerned about them. You say, don't you pray for your finances? Never. Don't you pray for the finances of this church? Never. Why should I? God's promised that if I'm in His will, He will equip me with everything good to do His will. So that also means finances. All I have to do is make sure I'm in His will. And guess what? Finances come. I just thank Him for them. When the Lord speaks to us about a need, and right now I'm, I'm speaking for $100,000 plus to get a new parking lot put in. It's, it's building in my heart, and I'm speaking it out there, and it'll come. I'm not asking God for it. 
I just know that it's coming and praise God. I really don't pray for it. I just say, thank you, Jesus. That's good. And I'm getting, I'm getting pregnated with that $100,000. Because it's God's will. Why? Because I'm seeking His face with all my heart. Now look at verse 5. This, this is so powerful. And this is, again, this is showing you how David, he delighted in the glory and grace of God. He delighted in the presence of God. That's why he did all the will of God. That's why he repented when he, when he committed murder and adultery. It didn't stop God. David came back to God and says, Oh God, only to you alone have I sinned. Don't take your presence from me. And in the old covenant, God could take his presence. David's seen King Saul lose the anointing and presence of God. Now in the New Testament, God's not going to take his spirit from you. We're, you're, your spirit's, the Holy Spirit's with you forever. However, you can get over in the carnal realm so much that, that uh, you're in dangerous territory. But the Spirit's still in you. Not going to leave you. So the Old Testament prayer of David, Lord, cast me not from your presence, take not your spirit from me. That's not a New Testament prayer. But that was David's heart for God that says, God, I, David was saying, I'm not like, going to be like Saul. I don't care about being a king. I don't care about any of this stuff. Just don't, let, don't take your presence from me. God, it's your presence and spirit that I want above all things. And that's why David then was a man that fulfilled all the will of God. So he didn't let shame steal anything from him. I'll read that in the scripture. It'll set you free. Again, gaze upon him. I'm going to do a message, how to be hidden in Christ, about gazing on him. Think about this. Gaze on him. He says, seek my face. Gaze on his face. We can do it, church, by the Holy Ghost. Part of it's looking into this Word. Others is the Holy Spirit just opening up the face of Christ to us. We can gaze on Him. We can gaze on His Word. We can gaze on Him by the Spirit. Gaze on Him. Listen to this. Join your life with His. And joy will come. Joy will come. When we join our life with His, joy comes. You say, well, I don't have any joy. You've not joined your life with His. You're not gazing on Him. You're gazing on those things that's making you unjoyful. Because see, if you gaze on Him, He... He takes care of this stuff. And we have faith to go through this stuff. I've gone through traumatic things in my life. Every day I, I have to fight the good fight of faith. And it's a good fight because I've already won in Christ. And my faith will bring into existence that which I'm hoping for. We all face things, church. Face hard times, tough times, good times. But listen to me. It's how we face things that determines the outcome. Either good or bad. And as we gaze upon Him, it's going to be all good. If you're gazing upon how bad your marriage is, you're not gazing on Him. If you're gazing on how bad your mate is, you're not gazing on him. If you're, if you're gazing on anything else, even yourself, you're not gazing on him. But if I gaze on him, I become like him. That's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, that's a good deal. All he has to do is say, look at me. I've, I've ministered to a lot of people in 46 years. And one of the things I've learned when people are in type, any type of shame or, or, or something they know from the Lord is not right, I, I lift their chin up and I say, look at me. Look at me. God loves you. Look at me. My kids sometimes would do something wrong and I'd lift them up and say, look at me. Look at me. I'm not mad. You did something wrong, but that's, we're going to fix it. 
Because you see, when God lifts your face and says, look at me, he's going to change you. He's not going to say, look at me and then say, you dirty worm, you, do, 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 you better repent of this sin or you're going to go to hell. That's not God. That's a demon inspired Pharisaic spirit and attitude. And that is not anybody that's looking at Jesus. Jesus lifts your face and say, look at me. Just look at me. I'm going to show you my love. And man, you will repent that quick. You'll change your heart because it's the goodness and mercy of God that leadeth to repentance. And when you look at his face, you see goodness and mercy. And you say, oh Lord, I'm sorry. You take away the shame of my youth. That's awesome. It's not your repentance that does it. You've got to hear me. It's not your repentance that does it. It's the one who grants you repentance. He's already accomplished it. Your sin's already forgiven in Christ. He's just wanting you to look at him and say, Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. And it'll be true godly sorrow. It's not being sorry you got caught. It's, Oh, God, I broke the heart of the one who's looking at me. Who's with such love. I've been to the throne of grace. I know what I'm talking about. (laughs) He's a good God. Gaze upon him. Join your life with his and joy will come. Listen to this. Your faces will glisten with glory. Your faces will shine with the glory of God. God will look upon your, people will look upon your countenance and see the countenance of God. Why? Because you're gazing on his face. When Moses saw God face to face, he came down, his face was shining. But see, we're already shining on the inside. I'm going to do one of the messages next few weeks is about this, how then that light shines out of us. And as we gaze upon him, think about this, our face shines with glory And I like what the the passion says in this last part. You will never wear that shame face again. You'll never wear that shame face again. What shame face? I'm so unworthy. Oh God, I've just messed up. Jesus has taken away your shame, church. And you won't have to walk around with shame on your face because you'll be holding the face of God and His face, His glory will shine through your face because it's working in your life. There is no shame for those who are in Christ Jesus. So this morning, we're going to take communion here in a minute, it's time for you to just take off the shame face. By gazing on him. As we break bread together. Eating of the flesh of Jesus. Drinking of his blood. Partaking of his nature. All that will go. It's already been dealt with. The blood has already dealt with it. While we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And it's the same message today. Whatever you did that caused shame, it was already forgiven. It was already dealt with by the blood of Jesus. And this morning, you can get set free. This morning, in fact, you can, this morning, if you hear what the Spirit is saying to you, come, experience my love. Experience my glory and grace. That will give you glory. Come and look and look to me face to face. I want you to see me. I'm not hiding from you. See, God initiates. We respond, God fulfills. That's a spiritual sandwich. We never initiate anything with God. God's the initiator. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Here in His love. Not that we loved Him. He loved us. So here's my spiritual sandwich. God initiates. We respond by faith and God fulfills it. All he asks us to do is believe it and have faith and obey. That's all he's asking of us. Then he can fulfill what he initiated in your life. He said, seek my face. Lord, I, with all my heart, I seek your face. 
Here's my face. Isn't that awesome? God's a faithful God. And church, He's calling us. And those that's watching out there, I forget to say hello to you. Thank you for joining us. There's good brothers and sisters out there. But what I'll say to us, church, is God is moving us. And He moves us into the glory. He's moving us into His very own presence. And in this presence, we get to put on a glory face. And not walk around in a shame face. I expect in 10 years from now, when I'm 82, to have more of a glory face than I have now. I'm just going to go from glory to glory. Why not? All of us are being called by the Spirit right now to Himself. Are you sensing this? All He's asking you to do is what the Scriptures tell us. Lord, I just seek You. I want to know what it is to delight in Your glory and grace. I have a moving, moving pulpit. <laughs> Father, I want to thank you for your, your great invitation to seek your face. Your great open arms that uh, even now, even now we can come to the throne of grace boldly through the blood of Jesus Christ to receive mercy and, and obtain glory, obtain grace. You have opened a door for us to come and abide with you and you abide with us. This is all your work, Lord. It's all your plan. It's all your desires. I pray this morning that everybody's heart's desire will be even as David's, that they will seek you with all their heart. They'll gaze upon you. They'll want you more than anything else. And you can remove all shame, all guilt, all condemnation, let them have the face that reflects the glory of God. You're doing this in every life, Lord, and I know that I know it because you're preparing us a people for your dwelling place. So thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, that you release people today by your word that they can literally now come to you through the blood of Jesus Christ totally cleansed of all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord. And I, just right now, as we just sit in the presence of the Lord, in your own heart, if, you, if there are things in there that, that you just feel bad about, and you say, well, just right now, say, out of your own heart, say, Lord, this doesn't separate me from you. It makes me feel like I'm separated, but right now, Lord, I, I'd give it to you. Lord, forgive me, just cleanse me of this. Thank you that you've already done it. Thank you for the blood of cleansing right now in my life. As I come to break bread with you this morning, I can come with full of grace and glory, expecting healing, expecting deliverance, expecting God's face to shine upon me. I want you to to be my dwelling place and I want to dwell in you. I want to live in your presence. Show me your face, Lord, that I might be more like you every day. Thank you, Jesus.